Welcome to Central Baptist Church of Livingston, Texas. We're glad that you've chosen to study God's Word with us today. We'd invite you to visit our website, centrallivingston.com, to learn more about our mission to preach, to teach, and to live the gospel for the glory of God. Now, open your Bible or your Bible app and study God's Word with us. Father, we thank you so very much for your amazing grace. We can't sing or talk or think about it enough. We're so thankful for the privilege of being able to come and worship you, to be in your presence, to be with your people. What an honor to be able to to come into your throne room and try the best that we can to let you know how much we love you and how much we need you and how wonderful you are. Lord, you are beyond our imagination. You are beyond anything that we could ever expect and certainly deserve. And Father, we pray this morning that you would take our burdens. For I know that many of us walked in here this morning with burdens. Friends and family, situations, circumstances that weigh on us. And Lord, I pray this morning you would help us to, to lay those at the foot of the cross, to let them go, and to allow you to be God in every situation in our life. And Lord, that as we attempt to pick those things back up, that you would encourage us, challenge us to let you have them. And Lord, we pray this morning that you would speak to your word. Lord, that your word would have freedom your spirit using your word to change us into your image, that we would be the people you've called us to be, that this could be the church you've called it to be, Lord, that that your work would be done this morning. Father, we need to hear from you today. We've heard from people. We've heard from you. We'd rather hear from you. So, Lord, I pray this morning that you would speak through your word that we would be ready to listen, that our barriers would be dropped. And even more than listen, Lord, we would be ready to obey, to follow, to surrender, to sacrifice. For you are all we need. All we hope for. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, it's good to be back here at Central. Familiar faces, many, and uh, new faces. I'm glad to be back. I'm glad Sonny invited me. Um, love coming to Central Baptist Church in Livingston. I want to invite you to open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. Just as you're, as you're turning there, I am Steve Brazell. I'm the Director of Missions for Unity Baptist Association. For those who don't know me, we work with uh, Southern Baptist churches in Polk and Angelina County. We've got about 54 churches in our association. Um, And a couple of things that have happened since I was here last. Uh, We have moved our offices into uh, a little office space in Dybal that we purchased and uh, excited about that. We're just about completely finished with our renovations and Um, occupying the entire building. So that's exciting because that's one less project. You know how that feels when you get a project off your board, you know, and you can take something and say, okay, I can set that aside. And of course, you know what we do at that point is we never put anything in its place, do we? No, we do. (laughs) But um, we're excited about that part of it. We've had a good year as an association, um, giving from the churches, and we appreciate Central Baptist and your partnership with us. Uh, Our giving from the churches has been up. It's enabled me to go from three days a week to four days a week. 
Uh, so I look forward to that. I'm in Lufkin, uh, Livingston from Sunday to Wednesday now every week. We've also been able to help uh, about eight churches, I think, so far this year. We've given uh, church grants to about eight churches, most of our smaller churches that have needs in some way or another, and we give them a grant uh, up to $500 to help them through whatever they're doing. Uh, so that's because of the gifts that people have given towards our association. We have our conference coming up. I saw the, um, the uh, slide for it earlier, the Impact Conference coming up at the end of August, and I'd encourage you to be a part of that. We're looking forward to having, uh, I think we've got 19 different presenters coming. We'll have over 50 different uh, uh, sessions, including nine sessions in Spanish. So we're excited about that uh, growing uh, impact on all of our churches. It's a way of helping our leaders be trained, whether you're new or you're experienced, a veteran in leadership, there's always something there for you. So if you haven't already thought about that, put that on your calendar for August the 27th up in Lufkin. We're excited about that. But to get down to the real business of why I'm here today, I did stop at Whataburger on my way. I know that was a question many of you were wondering about. <clears throat> I did. I appreciate Central Baptist Church because when I left, you gave me so many Whataburger gift cards, I didn't have to buy Whataburger for six months. <laughs> and I want you to know that's significant because I go there a lot, um, probably too much. I know when the people at the window change. That's probably too much, you know. I see them out and they wave to me when we're not at Whataburger. That's probably too much, my wife says. But uh, I am excited about sharing with you out of God's Word, Matthew chapter 18. This is, uh, we're going to look at three little vignettes here. <clears throat> the truth about all of this is, it's, a, it's about discipleship and questions that Jesus asks. And in, in essence, what I want you to hear this morning is this, that if you're going to follow Jesus, you're going to have to follow Him on His terms and not yours. And that's, that's a real mind blower for a lot of us. That if I'm going to follow Jesus, I have to follow him on his terms and not my own. So we're going to look at these three little situations, three different people. And we kind of see an escalation in the expectation and the challenge and the intensity of what's going on here in each one of these situations. So we're going to break them down. Let's look at chapter 18, beginning at verse 18. <clears throat> it says, when Jesus saw a large crowd around him... He gave the order to go to the other side of the sea. This is the Sea of Galilee. And a scribe approached him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus told him, Foxes have dens and birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. A scribe comes to Jesus. The scribe is a person who is uh, religious. They are educated religiously. This is a significant person in Jewish religion. This is a person who has great knowledge, who has studied well, who is devoted. And yet this person is coming to say to Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. That is a significant move by this teacher of the law, this scribe, because they are proclaiming their allegiance to Jesus, which means they have to turn their allegiance to their, their group that they're a part of, the scribes and Pharisees. You know, the scribes and Pharisees typically are against Jesus, right? Almost every time when we see scribes and Pharisees, they're against Jesus. But here a scribe comes to Jesus and says, I'll follow you wherever you go. That's a statement of faith, isn't it? This is a, a response to a gospel message, the gospel message that, that we believe that Jesus lived and made real for us. And that is that every person is loved by God and valued by God, but every person has sin, right? Look at the person next to you and go, you're a sinner. Just elbow them right on the side, you're a sinner. Because they are, but so are you. They're elbowing you at the same time. We're all sinners. Everybody in this room is a sinner, right? Everybody watching online is a sinner. When you go out to eat, everybody in that restaurant's a sinner. Bunch of sinners. You go to the gas station to buy gas, the people pumping gas next to you, sinners. You go to work, the people work next to you, a bunch of sinners. You're in school, you know who you're in school with? A bunch of sinners. Because we all are. 
The gospel message is, though, that God loves us so much that because of our sin and because of the need that it creates for us to have a relationship with him that has been broken, he sent his son Jesus to live and then die on a cross. And then when Jesus died on the cross, he didn't die for his sin because he had none. He died for our sin. He died for your sin and for my sin. He died for the sin of everybody you're going to meet at the restaurant or at the gas station at work or in school. He died for all of their sin, right? Paid the penalty for it. And then he invites us to put our faith and trust in him, to follow him. Wherever he leads, I will go. When you follow him, he gives you eternal life. He forgives your sin. He wipes it away. He cleanses you of all your sin. He makes you as white as snow so that you may have a relationship with him and you enter into a relationship with him that that relationship can never be broken it's for eternity so you spend eternity with him instead of if you don't enter into that relationship with him you spend eternity away from him apart from him that's the gospel message and that's what this teacher this scribe is responding to he has heard jesus preach he's heard him teach and he now says i will follow you wherever you go does that sound like a person making a profession of faith in christ it does to me sounds like somebody that walked down the aisle of a church one one sunday or one wednesday or one day at vbs or somebody that talked to their pastor somebody that talked to their mom and dad at the kitchen table and said i want to follow jesus for the rest of my life this is a good thing, isn't it? Because this was hard. You know, it's easier for some of us. It, I guess maybe it kind of seems easier for some of us. I grew up in church. I was the baby in the window in the nursery that everybody looked at, you know, and said, look at that ugly baby. Um, no, they didn't say that. But I, that's who I've been in church my whole life. And so in some ways it was easier for me to come to Christ because I had been in it. In other ways it was hard because I had been in it. <laughs> And sometimes you think, because I've been in it, I already got it, right? But I had been exposed to it my whole life. But this teacher not only had the information that Jesus given him uh, kind of radicalized his understanding of what it meant to follow God, but because he was a member of a group that was anti-Jesus, for him to come to Jesus and say, I'll follow you wherever you go was tough. Because that meant he had to turn his back on so much. When I came to Christ, I didn't turn my back on my family. My family was so excited that I did that. When this guy came to Christ, he had to turn his back on all of his friends, his family, his work, everything. And he said, teacher, Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. And I want you to look at how Jesus responds, because this was difficult, right? Imagine how difficult it was. And then Jesus says to him in verse 20, foxes have dens, birds of the sky have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. Doesn't that seem like a rather odd response to a guy who just said, I'll follow you wherever you want to go, wherever you take me, I'll go? Jesus was, in essence, asking him, because he's saying, you know, I don't have a place to sleep. He was asking this man, when you say you will follow me, does that mean, first question, will you sleep on the floor if that's what's required? When you say you'll follow me, will you follow me really? You know, it's interesting that Jesus kind of dispels any myth that this man have, have had about the cost of following, right? <clears throat> Immediately he says to him, you know, I'm going to, I sleep on the floor. I don't have a place to lay my head. I don't have a home. I don't have a bed. You really going to follow me anywhere? It's the first challenge in what I might call demanding discipleship. If you're going to be a follower of Christ, you need to understand that <clears throat> the level of commitment that he asks of you today, he will escalate tomorrow. What he asks you to do now will become larger tomorrow, bigger tomorrow. He will challenge your faith. You need to be prepared that Jesus will challenge your faith because that's how you grow. That's how you grow in your faith, how you get deeper in your faith. And so this man who makes a big decision... I'll turn my back on everything, and Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. Jesus says, really? So you'll sleep on the floor with me? Uh-huh. <laughs> we don't know what he says. But look what happens next. The next one, verse 21. Lord, another of his disciples said, first, 
let me go bury my father. But Jesus told him, follow me and let the dead bury their own dead. Now, I'm just going to tell you that when you first read that, it sounds rather harsh, don't you think? But what we don't know is whether the guy's father was actually dead or not. <laughs> you ever think about that? He said, let me go bury my father. It wasn't like he was headed to the funeral that day. In fact, it may have been that his father was still alive, and most likely he was. But before we can look at what he says, we have to look at who he was. Who was this person who came to Jesus? It says, another of his disciples. This is one of the followers. Not one of the twelve, but one of the followers. So the first case we have the scribe, who's not a follower of Jesus, who has a grabbed hold of the gospel and said, Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you want me to go. But here we have a disciple who we think has already made that proclamation, right? I'll follow you wherever you want me to go. And Jesus says to, one of, to, to this man who is his disciple, really? You said, let me go bury my father. I, I'll do it, Lord, but, but first, let me wait until dad dies because I need to take care of him. And then once, once that happens, then I'll go. The question is, will you sleep on the floor? Second question, would you leave your family? If that's what it meant to follow me, would you leave your family? first guy, the scribe, makes his initial proclamation of devotion, but this disciple, this follower of Jesus already, is now challenged to go farther. Can, can I just wait until this period of my life passes? Once I kind of get through this, then I'll be freer. Then it'll be easier. You know, then I can really do that. Have you ever had that thought about something? You know, once I get through this time of life, then I'll have time to really be devoted to the church. Then I'll have time to really follow Christ. You know what you find out through that? I don't know if your experience is like mine, but what I find out is that when I get to that next phase of life, it just gets busier. I mean, oftentimes we think, you know, young people will say, well, I'm going to go to church, but I'm going to wait till I have kids because I want my kids to grow up in the church, so I'm not going to do it now. And then they have kids, and boy, you get really busy then, don't you? Well, once my kids are kind of walking, and, and they don't have to be carried everywhere, because that'll be easier. <laughs> well, now, once my kids get in school, then my life will calm down. It'll get more of a rhythm to it, right? Because when your kids are in school, that, then you're nowhere near as busy, right? Well, you know, once my kids graduate, then I'll have a lot of free time. No. Well, once I retire, then I'll have a lot of time. Now, I'm, I, I've talked to a lot of retired folks who are like, can I go back to work? This is killing me, this retirement. Especially those men who end up back home and they see that list that their wife has for them, you know, and they're like, uh, I really got to get a job, sorry. <laughs> We could keep putting it off and putting it off and putting it off and putting it off and never get there. That's what this guy's doing. Well, Jesus, first, I'll follow you, but let me go bury my father. Let, let me get through this stage of life. See, the truth is, is he really didn't want to change his life as he knew it. He liked the way his life was right then. He was really saying, can I follow you, Jesus, and still live the life that I have now? Well, let me tell you, you cannot go with God and stay where you are. It doesn't happen that way. Jesus must be most important. Not one of the priorities, the priority. Not the, let me just say this, not even the highest priority, the priority. If you make Christ the priority of your life, everything else will fall in order. But if you just make Christ one of the priorities in your life, nothing else will ever fall in the right order. He must be the most important because only Jesus has the authority to demand such from us. Let me tell you that, that if your husband says, I need to be the most important person in your life, he does not deserve that spot. 
If your wife says, I need to be the most important thing in your life, she doesn't deserve that spot. Your kids don't deserve that spot. Your parents don't. Only Jesus can make that demand. Now, if Jesus makes that demand on you, then your husband and your wife and your kids are going to be important to you also, aren't they? Because that would be part of following Christ. But only Jesus can make that demand on your life. Only Jesus can say, I must be most important in your life. The number one, only priority of your life. Only he can make that demand. And this this other thing, discipleship is always a present obligation. Discipleship is never something that you can get to when you have time. Discipleship is a now thing. It's not a well when later on. It's a now thing, and that goes for whatever age you are. Whether, what was the number, 5, 55, or 105? Do we have any 105-year-olds? I don't know, maybe. Whatever age you are, discipleship is for right now. So don't be thinking, well, once I become a youth, then I will. Once I be, get out of, you know, I'm just in junior high now. It's not that big a deal. No, it is now. Well, once I get to high school, no, once I get to college, no, now is the time to be a follower of Christ. Now is when he calls you. And let's say one other thing about this, because this requires sacrifice, doesn't it? You'll have to sacrifice some things. If I'm going to follow Jesus, then I'm going to have to let go of some things that are important to me. That's what sacrifice is. Sacrifice is not letting go of stuff I don't care about to begin with. Okay, so like if you've got a lot of clothes that you don't wear anymore, you know, you've still, if you still have some 70s bell bottoms in your closet somewhere that you're just hanging on to till they come back in style, <clears throat> and then finally you decide, you know, I probably ought to just give these to Goodwill, and you go and give them to Goodwill, you haven't sacrificed something you haven't worn in 50 years. But if you go down and spend good money that you have now on something and give it to somebody, well, that's got a little bit more of a sacrifice, right? If I give something that's valuable, now it's a sacrifice. But this demand to sacrifice for us, to give up that which we value, is for now. But even harder than that, our our willingness to follow Christ in discipleship sometimes means we must ask others to make sacrifices as well. And that's hard. Let me give you an example. The International Mission Board of Southern Baptist Convention has appointment services. I've been to a couple of them where they are appointing missionaries who are going to be going all over the world, right? And what they do when they have this is they'll have the couple come up on the stage and they'll introduce them and talk about where they're going. Maybe their family, their kids might be with them. Sometimes it's just a couple. And they'll ask people in the audience, if you are related to them, when we call them up, then you stand up. So let me tell you something. When you see a young couple with their two kids come up on stage and say, we're going to the other side of the world to share the gospel, and you see four grandparents stand up, who know, I'm not going to see my grandkids, but maybe once a year. And I'm going to have to spend a lot of money to go do that. That couple that surrendered, that sacrificed so much to go, has also asked those grandparents to sacrifice, haven't they? And that's hard. Now, you're not a grandparent, you may not figure that out. But the grandparents in the room know, right? Right? To not get to see my grandkids, you're going to take my grandkids to the other side of the world? What do you think you're doing? Now, some of you know that uh, one of our daughters and our grandson, Jackson, lives with us. I've talked a lot about Jackson when I was here before. And I've told my daughter, Courtney, I said, Courtney, I know one day that you're going to leave, you're going to move out, but we're keeping Jackson because <laughs> we like him more. <laughs> I told her that. She knows that. That's not a secret. Let me tell you what, the Lord may call you to sacrifice, and that will be hard. He will. Let me just take out the may. He will. But what he may do is he may call you 
to require sacrifice from others as well. Will you leave your family? Third question. Verse 28. Remember back in the beginning Jesus had told them, you know, let's go to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. So verse 20 or verse 23, sorry. As he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And suddenly a violent storm arose on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But Jesus kept sleeping. So the disciples came and woke him up, saying, Lord, save us. We're going to die. Now, you, did you hear my texts in that? It says we're going to die. But that's not what they said. They said, we're going to die. It's happening. They were serious about this, right? He said to them, why are you afraid? You have little faith. Then he got up, rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? Even the winds and the sea obey him. So the 12 disciples get into a boat with Jesus to go to the other side. And among the disciples, there are several fishermen, right? People whose life is lived out on the Sea of Galilee. <clears throat> they are extremely experienced, knowledgeable. They know how it works. They know how to move a boat. They, they are aware of storms. They've been in them, no doubt, often in their fishing days. Now, I think it's probably likely that some other boats also followed, but not, we know for sure there were other boats out on the Sea of Galilee, right? They're out on the lake that day. But here we have the 12. Sea of Galilee is relatively small, but very deep. Storms can come up suddenly. It's not unusual. Have anybody ever been on the lake when the storm came up? <laughs> and you're like, where did that come from, right? Didn't see it at all. You've been out in the bay, and suddenly the storm was there. That was these guys, right? Let me ask you this. Did Jesus... When he told them, let's go to the other side, did he know a storm was coming? Well, yeah, he knows everything, right? He knows. Why in the world would Jesus lead his disciples to get into a boat knowing that a storm was coming? Why would Jesus lead his followers into the storm? You ever thought about that? I think most times we think Jesus only leads us out of the storm, right? But here we see a clear instance where I think understanding who Jesus was, that he led them into a storm. And he went into the bottom of the boat and took a nap. I like that. I don't know about you, but I feel like that may be the way I'm most like Jesus I can sleep pretty much anywhere. That may be the one way I'm most like him. I can just sleep anywhere. Jesus lays down in the boat and he goes sound asleep. And the, these people, these disciples, <laughs> the storm arises and they are afraid for their lives. You see that in verse 24. A violent storm arose on the sea so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. You know what that means, being swamped? That means the waves are coming over the side into the boat, and somehow Jesus is in the bottom of the boat still sleeping. That is a sound sleeper, right? I mean, water's landing on him. He's still out. It says, Jesus kept sleeping. So the disciples came and woke him up. <laughs> you know there was, some, there was some talk going on, right? They were talking, and, and the fishermen, Peter, James, John, Andrew, the fishermen, they were giving instructions, right? They were telling Matthew, the tax collector, get out of the way. You don't know what you're doing. We know what we're doing. And I'm guessing that Peter and John were probably arguing about what they ought to do. And, and you know, Peter knew he was right. And so he was telling everybody what to do. And, the, and it's not happening. It's not getting any better. And, and they're trying to fix all this because Jesus is really tired. And obviously he's tired. He's still asleep. And they're doing everything they can to try to save the boat. And finally somebody says, Jesus, would you help Wake up, they come over, they shake him. Would you please get a can't you tell we're about to die? Now let me just say that when fishermen, professional fishermen, are out on a boat in a storm and they are afraid for their lives, 
you are in trouble, right? Because I don't know. I mean, I've been on a lake. I've, I've been in a boat for 16 years, and that's been like 10 years ago. Um, that's a joke. It's a lot more than 10. Um, I've been on a boat a lot, and so I know how to fake like I know what's going on, right? I know, I mean, I'm a guy, so I know how to pretend that I'm in control. I got this. But I was sitting in a, in a little boat one time. We were out on Lake Ray Hubbard, and the storm came in, and I was sitting with the top over the boat, waiting for my, my friend to put the trailer back in the water, and hail was literally coming in sideways. And I thought, well, I'll sit in here and I'll be protected. It can't hit me from the back, and it couldn't hit me from the back. It went in, it hit that side, it hit this side, it hit me in the stomach. I mean, it was just, it was crazy. And I was a little concerned. I was glad there were four men who were willingly standing in the water at the boat ramp to hold your boat on the trailer while you pulled up because there was no way you could keep it on the trailer otherwise. It was a terrible storm. None of us were expecting it. And these guys were in the middle of the sea. When that happens, the Sea of Galilee is swamping their boat and they're afraid they're going to die. And Jesus wakes up and look what he does. He says to them, why are you afraid? Now, can't you picture the Jesus, look around, buddy. Do you not see what's happening? And then Jesus rebukes the wind and the sea, and everything goes calm like glass. You know what I find interesting? Just a little sidelight. All the other boats that were out on the Sea of Galilee that day, that were trying their best to survive in the middle of that storm, got to enjoy the calm too. They just didn't know why. Let me tell you, there are a lot of people in the world that enjoy the presence of Christ in the world who don't know why it's not worse than it is. That's just a little sideline. Here's the thing. These were the disciples. The first we had the teacher, right? the scribe. Then we had a disciple, but now we have the 12 disciples who are being challenged. Why are you so afraid, you of such little faith? Aren't you willing to give your life? Isn't that what he's saying? Aren't you willing to put your life in my hands? I'm on the boat. Do you think I'm going to die? Do you think, Jesus, that God sent his only son? Is that John 3, 16? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son to die in a boat on the Sea of Galilee. No. Why, why don't you trust me? Why can't you trust me here? You know, at the point that I might be proud of my faith, of my willingness to follow Christ anywhere, at that point he will challenge me once again. At the point where you might think, okay, now I am super Christian. God will put you in the middle of a boat on the Sea of Galilee during a storm. Why? Because this is how he grows our faith, our trust in him. Look at verse 27. These are the disciples. Think about, we're in, we're in Matthew 8. They've already seen a lot from Jesus, right? And here, they are amazed. What kind of man is this? <laughs> These were the disciples. These weren't just people, you know, following around. These weren't scribes and Pharisees. These weren't people that had, had momentary short range touches with Jesus. These were the disciples who were living with him every day, following him. They had left their stuff. They had left their families. They'd left their boats. They'd left their businesses. They'd left all of that to follow Jesus. And they're going, who is this guy? That even here, he can save us. Let me tell you, Jesus wants to get you in a place where you are amazed at what he can do. And the truth is, is that too many of us are afraid to live that thrilling of a faith life, 
to be amazed. We'd rather just kind of keep it in our little square, you know, where we kind of know what happens and we kind of understand how the world works and we know how church is and we've got all this figured out. But when he calls us out to a place where we have to be even farther, where we are afraid for our lives, if God doesn't do something, I'm not going there. There is a thrill living on the edge of your faith. Some people don't want that thrill. They rob themselves of the blessing of trust. There is a blessing in just trusting the Lord and saying, Lord, you're going to have to get me through this. Lord, you're going to have to do this. Now, the truth is he's going to have to do it anyway. If it's going to happen, he's going to have to. The question is, are we willing to follow him to that point where we will even put our lives in his hands? Lord, my life is yours. Whatever you want to do, wherever you need to do it. It's on the edge of faith where Jesus reveals himself to you in a way you've never seen it before. You really want to know him? Lord, I want to know you. I really want to know you. You're going to have to let him put you out on the edge of faith so he can teach you about who he is. Let me just say, don't think that you can get there. Find that out. Don't think that you can accomplish great things for him without great sacrifice. Don't have to be great sacrifice. And the call to every Christian, wherever you are in your faith walk, if you have have not made that decision yet to follow him, the call to you is to make a decision to follow Christ as your Lord and Savior. If you've just made that decision, then the call to you is to say, how much will you follow me? Will you, would you be willing to sleep on the floor if that's what it meant? If you've already made that decision, say, Lord, I'll go wherever you want me to go. Are you willing to walk away from your family if that's what he requires? Are you willing to move somewhere else and take another job somewhere or, or do something that, that is completely different that you've never thought you could do before? Are you willing to do that? And then when you do that, you say, yes, I'm willing to do that, and I do it. Are you willing then to put your whole, entire life in his hands and say, Lord, I'm yours. Whatever you need to do, wherever you need to go, if it requires me giving my life, then I'll give my life. I will follow you. You willing to take that next step of faith? To hear the Lord, to ask the Lord, Lord, challenge me. I have become stale. I have become content. I have become confident in where I am. And Lord, I need to be pushed. I need it. I'll never forget the guy that performed my wedding to my first wife and my only wife. Ed Wright, Ed was the pastor of Hillcrest Baptist Church. He moved from there to be an associate pastor of a church in Alabama, in Dauphin, Alabama. And Ed was in his mid-late 60s. And he said, I prayed to the Lord. I said, Lord, I think I've got enough in me for one more push. I think physically I, I can go one more, and I want to be on the edge And the Lord called Ed and his wife, Jana, to move to Vermont and start working with uh, Northeastern Baptist College, a small conservative evangelical Baptist college in Vermont, the only conservative evangelical college in all of New England. Started in 2013, Ed was in the first staff of that college. And they went to, from Alabama, they'd been in Texas and Alabama to Vermont And stayed there for eight or nine years until physically he just couldn't do it anymore. But he went to a place he'd never been, to work with people he'd never met, to do something he'd never done because he wanted to know what it was like to live on the edge of faith. He went for no paycheck. He and his wife lived up there for eight or nine years hardly ever got paid from the college because the college just didn't have the money. And somehow, the Lord provided all along the way. I love to know those stories. I love to read those stories. 
Wouldn't you like to live that story? Wouldn't you like to live that? Lord, put me on the edge of where I am now. Put me on the edge because there are things about you that I desperately want to know. And there are things about you that I want to live in my life. The disciples, (laughs) you thought they knew so much. And yet even they said, who is this guy? That even the winds and the waves obey him. They learned something about Jesus that day they never knew. There's so much he wants you to know. There's so much he wants you to do. There's so much he has for you. He is going to challenge your faith today, this week. And that's a good thing. Because it's an opportunity to find out more about him that you could never know otherwise. So this week, this month, very soon, your faith level where you are now will be challenged. And my encouragement, my exhortation, my challenge to you is to say yes. To not say, uh, let me get through this point. And it's okay if at a point in the middle of that you're, you go run into the Lord and say, Lord, I'm going to die. Let him be your Lord. Let him be your answer. Let him be God in your life. And that may be a little scary, but man, it sure is fun. When you see him show up and do stuff that you know, I didn't do that. And nobody else did that. And that was God. That's a good place to be, folks. Afraid for your life. Scared of where you are. But knowing you're in the place where God put you, I would much rather be in the middle of Syria, Damascus, where I was in 2006. I would much rather be there in the hands of the Lord than here on my own. I'd much rather be there. Would you be willing to say yes? This week, the Lord's going to challenge you. Are you willing to say yes? This morning, the Lord may have challenged you. In fact, last week, he may have challenged your faith. And you came here this morning because you needed somebody to say, hey, say yes. Say yes. Let's pray together. Heads bowed and eyes closed Every Christian's praying, Lord, we come to you this morning. We thank you for your bold invitation to us to follow you. Lord, I thank you that, that when you call us to follow, you make a way for us to follow. And that you don't leave us, you don't forsake us when we come after you. But Lord, you are there always at the end of that place. There you are. So, Lord, I pray for those this morning that are struggling with that faith, that are struggling with the a willingness to follow you, that have they know in their lives right now they have a call on their heart, and they're battling within their own souls about whether to follow you or not. Lord, I pray that you would give them courage, <clears throat> boldness, faith to trust you and to let you be God in their lives heads bowed and eyes closed as God speaks to your heart this morning. Maybe you came here this morning. You came to church because you're searching for an answer. That answer is the person of Jesus Christ. And if that's you this morning and you're searching for an answer, I'd encourage you to be like that scribe was. You just say, Jesus, I'll follow you wherever you go. Or maybe you're at another place in your walk. You've already made a decision to follow Christ, but the truth is you've got some faith decisions you're struggling with. You've been battling in your own heart with a confidence in following the Lord and knowing that he'll answer that call. Follow him. Say yes to him. In just a moment, we're going to stand and sing. And when we do, if you find yourself to be like that scribe and you need to make a decision to follow Christ, when we stand to sing, I want to invite you to come down here. I'll be standing here. Ethan will be here. Come and talk to us about what it means to follow Christ. If you've got another 
faith decision that you're struggling with about whether or not you ought to follow and you just need somebody to pray with you, I'd invite you to come. We'd love to pray with you. Or maybe you just need to come and put something before the Lord. The altar here is open. And I know you can pray right where you are, but there's something about coming to the altar in church and putting some things down and leaving them that are so very important to us. However the Lord has spoken to you this morning, you've got a decision to make. If you need to join this church family, what a great church to be a part of. In just a moment, when we stand to sing, you make your decision. You come. We'll be standing down here in the front to pray with you, to talk with you. For the altar, just come and pray. Father, we give you this time. You offer us the privilege of following. Today, we say yes. We say yes. Lord, we don't need a bed to sleep in. We'll just follow you. We say yes and leave our family. If that's what you call us to do, Lord, we'll leave. Walk away from mom and dad and venture out where you've called us to be. Lord, we'll say yes. If you ask us to give our lives, yes. Lord, we say yes to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we stand and as we sing, you've got a decision to make this morning. I'd encourage you to come. We're going to stand and sing. You come right now. Don't wait. You come. Thank you for tuning in to one of our services. We would love to invite you, if you're ever in the Livingston area, to worship with us. We're located at 503 Northeast Avenue in Livingston, Texas. Here at Central Baptist, we are an intergenerational body of baptized believers with a blended style of praise who value expositional preaching, meaningful membership, consistent discipleship across all ages, and a gospel emphasis both locally and globally. If you'd like more information about Central, please visit our website at centrallivingston.com. Once again, thank you and have a blessed day.